Thank you very much, uh, Kaki, for inviting me. I had spoken at your uh, at the Kaki Lab about um, three years ago, perhaps, and uh, it's nice to come back and share my research uh, with this audience. Uh, I will begin by looking at the 19th century. As the introduction suggested, my focus is on Indian doctors who were, according to me, very vital intermediaries in the promotion of Western medicine and also in coping with, uh, you know, various epidemics. These epidemics would come uh, one after the other in the 19th century, cholera, smallpox, epidemics at pilgrim centers. And uh, these doctors were very vital in the sense that smallpox vaccination was introduced in Bombay from the middle of the 19th century. And there were these doctors who had to counter superstition, who had to counter opposition, but I have mentioned Ananta Chandroba, Dukle, Baudaji Lar, Narayandaji, Atmaram Pandurang, Tarkarkar, Shantaram Kantak, and Sakaram Arjun Raut, all of whom promoted smallpox vaccination. It was very important that this was being promoted by Indians. And therefore, you know, the receptivity from the public would be. Uh, more apparent because they would look, the public would look upon the uh, foreign doctors with suspicion. So in that sense, that is why I call them vital intermediaries. So in the 19th century, it was primarily cholera control, prevention of epidemics at pilgrim centers, promotion of the smallpox vaccination, and also, interestingly, they formed what was called the Bombay Medical Union. And they were very powerful voices in Bombay civic affairs. They would, what I call, dissect reports of the health officer. And here I mention Katrak and Thomas Blaney, uh, who was actually an Irishman who practiced in Bombay. And both of them indicted the health department before the onset of the plague epidemic. As you may have heard, the plague epidemic was a terrific epidemic in 1896. And interestingly, uh, the first to diagnose was an Indian doctor, Vegas. He was later president of the Bombay Municipal Corporation. And Ismail Jan Mohammed diagnosed two cases of pneumonic plague. So it was bubonic plague and pneumonic plague as well. The, there were fewer cases of pneumonic plague. Now, what is very interesting is that you had Hafkin. I don't, we don't have enough time to talk about Hafkin, but Hafkin was this remarkable personality who was actually working in Calcutta when they summoned him to Bombay to come and look for some kind of prophylactic which would, you know, control the plague epidemic. So Hafkin worked in what is today the Grant Medical College uh, in a laboratory there, and he developed the pr prophylactic. And it's interesting that his assistant was this gentleman called Surveyor. And here is a picture of Surveyor who injected Hafkin. This is the uh, thing that I would like to point out. He injected Hafkin with the prophylactic with a dose which was four times stronger than was later accepted as standard. This was because he, they were trying to see how effective it would be. And uh, it's interesting that Surveyor, whose picture is here on the screen, uh, was his assistant. There were other it, it, there were other Indian researchers at the Hafkin Institute. It was not called the Hafkin Institute at that point. 
It was first called the Plague Research Laboratory, then the Bombay Bacteriological Laboratory. And later it was named the Hafkin Institute after Hafkin. Now here I have a list of uh, doctors uh, and scientists actually, who assisted Hafkin. One of them was Kalapesi. He was, uh, he was an assistant along with surveyor. They also worked on, there, there is also a reference to this gentleman called Avari, C.R. Avari, who was a member of the Plague Research Commission. And it is, they went into the cause for plague and uh, finally they uh, identified the rat. Now, what they established was that plague spread among rats and from rat to man, only through the rat flea. The rat flea bit man only when deprived of its natural host, the rat. The infected rat fleas were carried on the clothing of persons or in goods coming from an infected area. And often the human agent may just escape the infection. They also established that bubonic plague was not infectious. Because you know, when the plague broke out, the colonial government imposed very draconian measures. You know, they uh, did inspections, disinfection, segregation of families, physical examination of men and women, which was a violation of the body, a violation of the privacy of the home and so on. And therefore, as you may be aware, there was a very, uh, very uh, vigorous opposition to this kind of intrusion. So this report, which was, pre which was prepared in 1908, much after the uh, epidemic had abated, ex uh, established that bubonic plague was not infectious and hence isolation was not necessary. But it is the pneumonic variety which was more infectious. I just mentioned this because I wanted to point out how valuable was the uh, contribution of these Indian doctors, stroke scientists. There are three others whom I have mentioned who worked on other areas. Shantaram Kantak worked on experiments on variola and vaccinia, that is in connection with smallpox. D.A. Tarkar, he promoted the pro plague prophylactic, and then he was the assistant director of the Hafkin Institute. Then you have S.N. Gore, who devised a simple method for bacteriological examination of water for detection of B. coli, dysentery, bacilli, and cholera-like vibrio. And then there was Soparkar, who carried out experiments to determine the effect of varying degrees of temperature upon nutritive quality of uh, blood when added to a plain medium for the cultivation of hemophilic organisms. Now, I would also like to draw attention to this fascinating doctor called Bahadurji. He, uh, in fact, he was, a, as you can see from that, uh, uh, it's a, actually a photocopy from the Hindu punch, Hindi punch. Uh, he, died, he died tragically during the play. And as you can see, he is being called conscientious, fearless, and independent. This doctor studied in England at the University College London, and then he gained research experience at the Pasteur Institute and in Berlin. And he went back to England for his BS and MRCS, where he won prizes for proficiency. On his return to India, he served as professor of clinical medicine and pharmacology at Grant Medical College. Following his resignation from GMC, because he fell out with his boss, this very interesting uh, correspondence about this, how he fell out with his boss, who was an Englishman called Wellington Gray, he set up an extensive private practice. Not only this, during the plague, it, he set up a hospital for the Parsis, 
And uh, he worked tirelessly in this hospital till he died in 1898. He was a very young man when he died. But before he died, he was, as the Hindi Punch said, he, as I have quoted on this slide, he was like a meteor because he campaigned in the 1890s against the British monopoly over the Indian Medical Service. And he campaigned for the separation of the civil medical service at, from the military service. He wanted actually hospitals to be manned by Indians. And that uh, dream of his was realized in 1926 when KEM hospital was set up. So here are, I'm uh, drawing your attention to a few of these personalities who were quite fascinating. One is Badurji. And one of the methods of combating this epidemic, they had to force people into the hospital. It was not an easy task. Of course, plague kills very quickly. So I will relate to you the experience of the next doctor, who was Nasarvanji Hormasji Choksi, who has left a report of the plague epidemic of 1896. He was in charge of the hospital, which today is called Kasturba Hospital, Arthur Road Hospital. He was, his name actually became synonymous with the treatment of infectious diseases. He remained in charge of the hospital till 1922, and he served as Secretary Indian Factory Commission. He was associated with the establishment of the Aqua Leprosy Hospital, which is in Varala even today. And he was on the board of management and member of the Viceroy's Leprosy Relief Fund. He prepared special reports on plague, leprosy, fevers, and cholera, and he edited this delightful little journal called the Indian Medico Chirurgical Review. He, in fact, in this uh, journal, they championed the cause of what Badurji had taken up, and they uh, he was the editor till he had to take over the Arthur Road Hospital, 1896 to 1893 to 96. He also contributed to the Lancet and to the Indian Medical Gazette. He was president of the Bombay Medical Union, and he campaigned for the recognition of parity of Indian degrees with British degrees. He was president of the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Bombay, and he was a member of the Bombay Medical Council. In fact, the British Medical Journal uh, mentioned his devotion to duty over many epidemics. He was awarded the CIE. Now I would like to draw your attention to his, uh, you know, this report which he has left. This is the picture of the Arthur Road Infectious Diseases Hospital. Uh, he has left a report of how he had to cope with uh, cases who would be brought to the hospital under compulsion and normally when they were beyond all help. And then he says he had to deal with pseudo specialists who would pretend to know all about plague and who would for a time forget that they were tram conductors, railway guards, engineers, postal inspectors or clerks and they would all have suddenly blossomed into being specialists. Choksi also tells us how, you know, it was so difficult to get uh, help. You know, the nursing was done by the All Saints sisters, but he could not find recruits to help him. And once they came, they would run away within hours or days because they had never seen so many people die of plague. Of course, it is a fact that they were brought to the hospital in a moribund condition. Numerous admissions and so many cases would just die. And Choksi had also, he says, to contend with rumors. Now, this is very interesting. The rumors were that the authorities were taking these 
people to hospital in order to remove their hearts. Now, why remove their hearts? Because at the beginning of the epidemic, there had been an attack on the statue of Queen Victoria. So the rumor was that these patients were being deliberately killed in the hospital, their hearts were being taken out and sent to the Queen in England to appease her wrath. And because her statue had been disfigured, and there was also a rumor that doctors are cutting up dead bodies and not returning them to their kinsmen and so on. In fact, this hostility culminated in a raid on the hospital, 29th October 1896, when it is said an estimated 800 to 1,000 mill workers rushed in, broke open the gate, scaled the walls, in order to wreak vengeance on the staff. Uh, some of them even reached the wards and even injured some patients, but no one was seriously hurt. They were dispersed by the police who continued to be stationed on the premises for some time. As for relatives and friends, Choksi writes, they were welcomed with the hope that they would supplement the efforts of the nursing staff. But they were so terror-stricken that they would not venture beyond the gates. And once the patient had been admitted, even children who were brought to the hospital by parents would be abandoned and their parents would give incorrect addresses and could not be traced afterwards. These children were later either adopted or cared for by the All Saints sisters. Toxie mentions his colleagues very uh, pays a tribute to his colleagues. Uh, one of them was called Pilgaukar and the other was a lady, Manik Tarkar. There was also, the, as we saw during the COVID, the danger of exposure to the disease. These doctors who were attending to these patients, you know, were uh, exposed to the disease and two of them are mentioned by uh, Choksi in his report, P. N. Dauda, he succumbed to the plague and did a lady, Annie Walk. She was actually employed at the Kama Hospital. She volunteered during the plague and she succumbed to the disease. So these, these are the kind of uh, records which are available, a kind of first-hand record which uh, I have consulted. And uh, there is no time now, but Choksi, uh, there's a lot on Choksi. In fact, I have a whole chapter on him in my new book. He collected statistics of patients and, you know, he uh, experimented with a serum treatment in plague cases. And he treated 275 cases with the subcutaneous method of admin administration. And he presented a paper on this at the Bombay Medical Congress, which I will talk about later. Now the next, there was a trio, it's very interesting, a trio of Choksi, Bhatwadekar, and the health officer, John Andrew Turner. This trio, were involved with the public health scenario in Bombay for the first 20 years of that century. As you can see, Bhatwadekar had a very remarkable uh, career, cha chairman standing committee, BMC, nominated member, Bombay Legislative Council. He was the Senate representative in the Legislative Council, Dean of Medicine, member of the City Improvement Trust, member of Council of the Governor of Bombay, President Bombay Medical Union. And here is his motto, treat your patient as you would your own son. The province of hygiene was not to cure, but to prevent disease. Now I have used three of his writings. He wrote many works, but I have used three of his writings to analyze uh, what he has to what were his what was his 
uh, basically his philosophy. Now, uh, it is interesting that he says the province of hygiene was not to cure but to prevent disease. After the plague, there is a change in the manner in which medicine was dispersed. It was to now be preventive rather than curative. And that is why he said, in, I have referred to his works in that work called Public Health, he says, a knowledge of the principles of sanitation is essential to human comfort and happiness. How many thousands of family uh, literally wallow in dirt and attribute the miseries to the strokes of misfortune? So you see, there is a rational argument in this. He was convinced of the efficacy of the plague prophylactic. And the second work that I have mentioned on the slide, uh, that was brought out later in 1898 uh, after the plague had slightly abated. And here he propagates the plague prophylactic and gives lots of elaborate statistics of uh, you know, where it has worked and how it has worked and so on. The third work which I have referred to is sanitary instruction. This is was written much later. It was actually uh, a uh, lecture which was published as sanitary instruction. And here he has lots to tell about how it is important to teach young children in school the principles of sanitation and hygiene. And here he says, the province of hygiene is not to cure, but to prevent disease by seeking out and determining thereof and laying down rules for their prevention and removal. So you see the uh, slant is towards preventive medicine and preventive measures. Hence, he says it had to depend for its advance upon the advances in pathology and etiology and these opinions, which he has expressed, in my opinion, both in public health, the work I have mentioned first, and in sanitary instruction are relevant even today. He was also associated with the Florence Nightingale Village Sanitation Fund. Excuse me. The third of the trio is this man, John Andrew Turner. John Andrew Turner became health officer in 1901 to 1919. With Choksi and Bartwadekar, he promoted various public health measures. There's no doubt that he was a colonial official. However, it's very interesting to see that these three had a kind of uh, collaboration. He was a favorite of the Hindi punch. There were cartoons shown. Uh, uh, shown, I mean, cartoons drawn showing him like a Pied Piper chasing the rats and swatting the mosquitoes, you know, in the anti malarial campaign. Now, uh, but uh, this Bombay, as I said, in the early 20th century, just after the plague, you have this promotion of preventing med preventive medicine. So, Bombay Sanitary Association was set up in 1904, mooted by Choksi and Turner. And here we see that it was supported by Atwarikar, Sir Ratan Tata, and many other philanthropists, and Firosha Mehta. And what is interesting is a lady doctor attended the inauguration in 1904, and that is Kashi Bai Naurange. Now, what did this Bombay Sanitary Association do? They visited chores, they advised on the disposal of refuse and personal cleanliness. They reported to the health department on the number of children to be vaccinated. They distributed leaflets in Marathi and Gujarati on the dangers of spitting disease and flies and practical hints on nursing and the rearing of children. They also trained caretakers of chores and they had a four-month course for instructors in primary schools on ventilation and disinfection. 
in Marathi and six month course for sanitary surveyors on food hygiene and communicable diseases. They conducted public lectures accompanied by magic lantern slides is long before the days of BPT. So Choksi gave the first talk, which was on some common sense views on plague. Glenn Liston, he was with the, the, what I call the Bombay Bacteriological Laboratory, which became the Hafkin Institute. He spoke on the structures of buildings to prevent rat infestations. And Shroff, he spoke on dengue. The man called W. W. Peter, he spoke on malaria. In fact, this Peter's uh, Peter would go around the streets with huge placards on malaria, you know, to educate the public. And they even used a gramophone to attract audiences. I have here Sir Ratan Tata, who supported this, uh, this uh, 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 what do you call, uh, initiative. And here is Sir Piro Shameta, great civic leader. He was a lawyer, municipal commissioner of the Bombay municipality, four times president. He was also one of the founding members and president of the Indian National Congress. He was knighted by the British government in India for his service to the law. And here is a delightful cartoon from the Hindi Punch, where Sir Firosha Mehta is shown steering the ship of the Indian National Congress, 1904. Now, in 1909, they held the Bombay Medical Congress. It's not that our Indian doctors were given prominence. The prominence was given to all the big wigs from the Western world. However, Choksi reported the results. They did, they were allowed to present papers. Choksi reported the results of the serum treatment in plague cases. But when Aker endorsed the efficacy of this treatment, he said that he had used it in his practice. And these two, Jahangir Karsetji and Bomanji Master, presented a paper called Unhygienic Bombay. And there they said, why do they give this unfortunate title? Because of the incomplete sewerage system, the improper location of cattle stables, the pollution of the soil, and the imperfect conservancy. Another doctor who presented, I'm only giving a few of, their, a few of them, is Kawasji Dada Janji who emphasized the importance of pure water because both cholera and typhoid were waterborne diseases and he advocated a constant water supply. Again, it's of interest that Krishna Bhai Kelaukar, she was the only woman on the Central Committee of the uh, Bombay Medical Congress. There are others who spoke, uh, but I may not have time because I want to also talk about the women doctors. Here is a cartoon again from the Hindi Punch. Now, after the Medical Congress was is the theme of this cartoon. And here you see this man kneeling before Hygieia. He says, what is wanted is a healer of poverty. Because the general impression was the Bombay Medical Congress was basically a colonial show. So what they want is really a healer of poverty. This is the theme of this. Now, one of the very important uh, initiatives taken by the Bombay Sanitary Association, and you know, this is the recognition of tuberculosis as a public health challenge. It's not as dramatic as cholera or smallpox or even plague, but it was a silent killer. So the Anti-Tuberculosis League was set up in 1912, again supported by Tata and others. And this is what they did. They notified the disease with the aid of medical practitioners. They examined individual patients at their homes. They provided for a central dispensary and information bureau. They examined both the family and other contacts. They did medical inspection in schools, mills, factories, railways, and docks. 
and they even had a, some hospitals which would admit advanced cases and there were even some sanatoria set up. Here again, we have Bartwadekar assuring the support of the Social Service League, which was a reformist body set up in 1911, and he, he was associated with it. So he promised that that would be supporting the Anti-Tuberculosis League. Kashipai Naurange, being a lady doctor, pointed out that tuberculosis was wreaking havoc among the poor, especially among women who lived in seclusion. R.B. Billamoria stressed the importance of early diagnosis and impressing upon the patients and the relatives the danger from sputum, because that's how it could spread. And they recommend, he recommended rest and proper nutrition. Sora Bejini, another doctor, recommended regulations against spitting and inspection of dairies. They had home visits. Nurses demonstrated the need to destroy infected material, collected mothers-in-law and lectured to them on the need to treat daughters-in-law with consideration and affection. They held public lectures describing the early signs, the importance of pure air and sunlight. They distributed leaflets on the various manifestations of tuberculosis, enlargement of glands, tuberculosis affecting bones, joints, the spine, abdominal tuberculosis in infants and children, treatment at dispensaries. Some patients, in fact, gave up. When the immediate symptoms were relieved, they would just not go back to the dispensary. So the volunteers would trace them with the help of these birth clerks, Karkur. And the anti-tuberculosis league no doubt created awareness of tuberculosis and it resulted in increase in hospital admissions. As we all know, there was the influenza pandemic in 1918. We are all aware of that because of COVID. And at that point, many doctors were away on war duty. So there was a medical subcommittee formed, and it included these doctors, uh, Bhatwadekar, Dada Chanji, G.V. Deshmukh, Erul Karnagutai, Joshi, Kashipai Naurangye, T.S. Sardesai, Chandulal Desai, and so on. Now, I would like to take up the other public health challenge. I hope I have at least 10 minutes. The other public health challenge was the high maternal and infant mortality rates. Indian philanthropy had established obstetric facilities even in the middle of the 19th century. But the numbers of patients were very few because an average Indian woman would not dream of showing herself to a male doctor. And the very idea of hospitalization for something as domestic as childbirth was unheard. And this is where Indian women doctors played a significant role. They were admitted to Grant Medical College in the 1880s, and the first batch of women doctors come out in the early, nine, uh, early 20th century. You have more and more women doctors in hospitals and dispensaries, and there is no doubt that their presence discounted anxieties, and they promoted better maternal and infant care. Another very interesting factor, both at the time of plague and now in with maternity facilities, is that when hospitals or even dispensaries were established for the exclusive use of castes and communities, they made for easier receptivity. Now, there is the celebrated Anandi Bai Joshi. She completed her MD at Women's Medical College, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and her thesis was titled Obstetrics Among the Aryan Hindus. And in this, she has detailed aspects from conception to infancy. She referred to 50% of women dying in the prime of their youth, partly due to ignorance or reluctance to communicate and partly due to the carelessness of her guardian or husband, close quote. I'm sorry, 
the next quote, we must not entirely overlook the history of past ages. They might enable us to a better appreciation of science and pay respect to the discoveries, theories, and application of remedies of different nations at different times. This is in her thesis. She was appointed resident physician of the women's ward at Kolhapur Hospital after she returned to India. But unfortunately, before she took charge, she passed away. Very tragic story. The next is Dr. Rakhmabai. She qualified for the MD in Brussels in 1894. She trained at the London School of Medicine for Women. And when she returned to India, she worked at Kama Hospital which is a very interesting institution because it was set up for women and children to be run by women doctors. So she was house surgeon there. Then she moved to Surat uh, and she was chief doctor to the princely states of Saurashtra, 1918 to 30. She has left some interesting observations of how she convinced women to come to the hospital for delivery by delivering a pregnant sheep. She said she had to do that because they were not convinced. She was awarded the Kesare Hin for her work during epidemics. Now, these women doctors whose names I have put up on the slide, they had their theories with regard to what they call preventive obstetrics. Supervision of women from early pregnancy till lying in was over, was the solution to maternal and infant mortality. Jerbanu Mistri, she said, we need more maternity homes and antenatal care for expectant, expectant mothers, postnatal supervision. And very interestingly, she said, let us negotiate with the dai. The dai is very powerful. So let us negotiate with them and train them. And Jerusha Girard, also a doctor, she said, all mothers and grandmothers continue to hold sway in Indian families. And they impart their time-honored customs to the next generation, even as meetings are held in town halls to organize welfare. She held that a large percentage of maternal morbidity was avoidable. It was ignorance and superstition that prevented access to modern methods. These schemes were set up in the uh, first two decades of the 20th century, the Lady Willingdon scheme, supervision of women from early pregnancy till lying in was over, propagation of the concept of maternity homes and establishment of maternity homes, training of dyes on the value of cleanliness and the use of antiseptics, Bombay Presidency Infant Welfare Society, infant welfare centers where children were weighed, weighed, provided with milk and treated for minor ailments, the Bombay Presidency Baby and Health Week Association, the Lady Wilson Village Maternity Association to train village dyes. I must tell you that these uh, schemes were partly funded by government and partly by donors. Here we have the voluntary initiatives, the Seva Sadan, which was founded by Rama Bhai Ranade. She's transformed the Seva Sadan from a lady social into a dynamic organization concerned with making widows self-supporting. Seva Southern ran maternity homes and infant welfare centers where expectant mothers were given free advice and medical supplies, uh, provided gratis at Pune, Mumbai, Sholapur, Kolhapur, Baramati, Ahmednagar, Alibagh, and Nasik. Seva Southern trained nurses, Seva Sadan had a public health school which trained health visitors. Now, I have chosen this particular cover from the uh, Bombay Baby and Health Week uh, Society Association's, uh, what do you call, magazine, for a particular reason. This is called the National Baby and Health Week. And you see how subtly they have used the figures in the in the 
uh, what do you call in the the words are care of the expectant mother ensures the health of the baby the healthy baby is a national asset half of the sickness and deaths in babies are preventable and what is if you look at the figures it's so well done there is a cradle and there is this lady listening to the doctor and the doctor has her doctor's back i feel that it's a very important message which they are trying to promote this bombay baby and health week association a uh, bombay yeah presidency baby and health week association had uh, uh, branches all over bombay presidency here i would just like to briefly uh, show you the slides of these three remarkable okay so here i'm just going to talk very briefly about these women dosi bai dado bai she was the first indian woman to complete her md in tropical medicine at the london school of medicine for women she was the first indian woman fellow of bombay university she opened a maternity clinic and she was honorary obstetric consultant at kama hospital and at km it is said she was the first to use radium in cancer cases among women in india she was associated with all these organizations which you can see including the red cross and she organized the blood transfusion service she was on the health survey and development committee this is a committee which was set up chaired by sir joseph bore you know we, we uh, i don't have time to go into that but she was an important functionary there the next is jerusha girard remarkable lady she was not uh, she could not get a post and then later she wanted to go abroad and and she couldn't uh, didn't have the but later she got a, a tata grant i think it was a loan and then she served at lady hardinge in delhi and senior surgeon bangalore maternity hospital then she started private practice in bombay but she is the first indian to serve as medical officer at kama hospital and under her guidance the work of the hospital expanded and undergraduate and postgraduate training facilities for women medical students were provided a fellow and member of the syndicate bombay university she you know they set up an association of medical women in india and she and dosi bai they were all members and she even served as president later she was on the icmr she was awarded the mbe and the padma shri i have a article on her which was published by the national medical journal of india fascinating uh, uh, ladies these are and here is rani rajwade who was born as nagutai joshi she was a member of the all india women's conference and she was on that subcommittee on women's welfare under the national planning committee she was educated in england and she did all her degrees abroad but when she came back to india she practiced medicine for 14 years set up her own consulting rooms nursing home operating theater and so on lastly i would just like to mention these women and conclude cecilia de monte she was also medical officer at kama hospital and there is jerbanu mistri again she was a member of the indian prostitution committee and she gave a note of dissent along with three others against the recommendations for regulation and punishment for prostitution she was also concerned with improving the standards of cinema films and worked to improve the condition of women in detention cells and in the mental hospitals of the presidency and there are other ladies whom i am, you can see this hazel machado she was a member of the social service league and she provided medical relief during the influenza epidemic of 1918 and myrtle machado she worked in the dispensary which was set up you know to combat venereal disease now i think i'll conclude here because my i have i exceeded my time 
and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Fascinating thank talk. You. I mean, to me personally, all the women's stories were amazing and things that I didn't, I mean, I knew about some of them, but not all of them. And it was really fascinating to know all that. Um, we have a few questions from the audience. I'm just going to pull those up. Um, Farooq asked, uh, who, are the, who are in the first batch of women grant graduates? Oh, the, uh, Farooq, I, I'll send you my paper because I have written about them in detail. Uh, is he there? Yeah, he is there, yes. Okay. I'll send you my paper, Farooq. And uh, you'll get all the information there. Uh, would you be able so, to just tell us any of the more popular, I mean, ones that we would have known in the first batch of women from Grant Institute? The batch, yes, Annie Walk was one of them. She, I told you she succumbed to the play. Then there was Prani Kama. Prani Kama actually worked for some time at Kama Hospital. But again, you know, she, I think she had some kind of a misunderstanding with the boss. You see, these British bosses were not very nice at times, like it happened with Badurji. So she moved away from Bombay. Mm -hmm. And then there are all these other ladies whom I have mentioned, Dosi Bai, Dadabai, they're all graduates of Grant Medical College. Some of them trained abroad, like as I have said, Nagutai Joshi, Rakma Bai, and of course, Anandi Bai Joshi. But there are, uh, uh, you know, it's actually been quite difficult to trace all their later careers. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, but I have uh, a paper on this and I will share it with, uh, yeah, so there are many okay. of them. And oh. one more thing I would like to say, you know, they, uh, that first batch, they sent a protest to the, uh, to the, uh, what is it called, to the uh, authorities to say that we are not being taught what the men are being taught. Oh, we are being taught a shorter course. Why is that so? We are equally capable of understanding because there were also all these uh, stigmas, you know, dissection and all these things. It's not easy. So there is that very interesting protest which they put up. That, yes, that, is, that, is, that is interesting. Yeah. That was uh, Jijina, Anik Tarkar was. She is another very fascinating character. She Thank married you. Badu's father. For yes, her. yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take the next question, which is by Pidos. He said that what work did uh, Dr. Rakhmabai do during the epidemic? Oh, she worked both during the plague and uh, uh, later, you know, because she worked in Surat and in uh, Rajkot. And that is why she was given the Kesare Him. And very important in her uh, writings, what you see is how she overcame the prejudices of women in those, I mean, she was not in Bombay City. See, she was in the uh, in what you call the hinterland, and there, she says how difficult it was to convince them to come for deliveries, you know. But she was very successful, apparently, and she had a long innings there. Okay, uh, Mayuresh has asked another question. He said that I noticed that most of them mentioned in the talk were upper caste. Uh, it is not surprising considering opportunities for studying medicine and practicing would be very rare for Dalits during those days. However, do right. we know any Dalit doctors during that time? And also, he was curious about how Indian doctors in the colonial uh, era navigated untouchability. It's an yeah. interesting question. Yeah. Oh. Very interesting. And no, we have no data on Dalit doctors. And my focus was only on this first. See, they start opened uh, courses to, uh, uh, what do you call, to women in 1883. And uh, I have kind of touched up to 1920. I've not gone beyond that. Right. Uh, because of shortage of time. 
But um, yes, it is a fact. And you know, you do read uh, also of racial, racial distance. You know, I have come across some references to how European doctors would not treat Indian patients. So there was that racial angle. Right. The unability angle is, yes, that would also be. Basically, in this period, the very idea of hospitalization was a stigma. I mean, you know, they felt they were all not only the rumors, mm -hmm. but there was also, you know, the pollution that could come. Pollution right. in inverted commas. Yes. Pollution that could come from, you know, and also the very, uh, what do you call, the profession of medicine itself. You see, to be accepted, mm -hmm. that itself was another, what do you call, challenge. Okay, so we have, uh, I have some um, references to how, you know, there would be a cane curtain between men and women. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not, not an easy thing. But yes, it's a very important um, uh, dimension which we have to explore. Yeah. Farooq had a follow-up question to his first one that was Dr. Manik Turkud yeah. among the first batch of uh, graduates? Manik Turkud. What did you... Uh, uh, Manik was. Yes. Yes. Okay. She's uh, Atma Ramadan's daughter, Farooq. Okay. Yes, doctor. Okay, uh, Sukhi has asked a question. Did the doctors here compare notes with their contemporaries in the US and Europe who also faced a lot of prejudices? Yeah, now uh, it, it's interesting that she asked this question because the first, uh, um, what was she called? Medical officer of Kama was Edith P. G. Phipson. She herself faced prejudices before she came to India. And in fact, when, uh, I mean, compare notes, yes. Uh, I mean, not like today, where you would have doctors, you know, communicating with their counterparts in, immediately I, on yeah. the internet. Yes. Yeah, no, but there would be, and as I have shown among these, with these, some of these ladies, they were trained in England and the London School of Medicine for Women, Rakma Bai, one of the earliest, and uh, Dosi Bai and so on. Uh, yes, that, that is one uh, interesting factor. And the other thing is that Edith P. G. Phipson herself, when she was appointed as medical officer, faced the male doctors trying to snatch away the donation which had been made by Kama to set up that hospital for women to be run by women doctors. So the male doctors of JJ Hospital said, these women need supervision. <laughs> so we have to have control over that and control over the funds. But the donors Sorabji Shapurji Bengali and George Kittridge, who donated to found, uh, establishing that whole thing, Kama funded it. So they said, no way. It will be for women, run by women. Well, good for them. I'm glad that they did that. <laughs> um... We have one more question uh, from Mayank. It says, uh, did any of these prominent associations and committees work on the sanitation and wellness in the area of Dharavi? Uh, yes, they did. In fact, I've not gone into sanitation at all because that's a whole big, uh, you know, various, uh, big uh, issue. Yes. But there are... Um, Yes, the doctors, what I found in my work is that the doctors were very concerned with civic issues, mm. whether it was water supply or sewerage or, you know, and yeah. as I 
institution, they did raise these issues. And later, I I didn't have time, but when they they were uh, there were doctors like Gilda who raised these issues in the Bombay Legislative uh, Council. You know, right. from yeah. 19, there were there was the Bombay Legislative Council, and there were doctor members there who raised many of these issues, and also malaria. See, malaria was a big uh, public health challenge, which I didn't have time to cover. But yeah. with malaria, again, you know, it was these doctors who raised the issues of, you know, covering wells and, you know, fumigating places and so on. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense because sanitation and health are so connected and that the doctors would have to take up those courses to solve bigger problems, I guess. Um, anyway, that's all we have for questions, uh, Dr. Ramana, but lot, many people have thank you for this wonderful talk and uh, everyone's really enjoyed this topic. And uh, a big thank you from us at Khaki also for coming on and doing it. And we hope to have you on again for other talks as well. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending today and uh, we hope to see you on more of our talks uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramanna. Thank you, Verena. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.